As you know, this is the fourth of our um, surgical webinar series. And as we've explained before, SAFMED is your trusted solutions partner and has been for a number of years, not only in the arena of CSSD, but also in your theatre equipment. In this five-part webinar series, we first started by covering uh, preparing for surgery and bad habits, and those bad habits can lead to all sorts of adverse effects. In webinar two, Bria Tutoy kindly taught us about what to monitor in the operating theatre environment to help from an infection prevention perspective. Webinar three, we began focusing more on risk and safety. Today being webinar five and next week, uh, so webinar four and next week, the 12th of November, is webinar five, the last in our series. What will we cover today? We're going to start talking uh, about patient safety. We'll delve into more depth about the ECRI reports. We refer to them briefly in webinar three, but we'll take a closer look at some of the reports over the last few years. Then we'll touch on radiation safety, an, an aspect important for all of us in orthopedics and neurosurgery, even neurology, and an uh, important concept to protect ourselves. Then the risky, horrible subject that none of us like, but I'm sure have all experienced, retained surgical items and specimen errors. Moving on to surgical lighting, ventilation, we'll touch on laminar flow, and we'll end off with the section on barriers to self-care. All about why nurses don't take care of themselves. ICRI is an independent non-profit organisation that are with the goal and the aim of improving the safety, quality and cost effectiveness of care in all health settings worldwide. ICRI was founded in 1968. You can belong to ICRI, become a member. It is quite costly from what I understand, but there is a variety of information that you can learn from them. We uh, thankfully can also download previews and pricey versions of the reports that they create and those come at no cost to us. So that's something that we keep an eye on all of the time. Those in procurement who, who, who will buy devices, medical devices, also keep an eye on these lists because they teach them lots about what are good products or if they're product issues or, or safety issues around various items. And um, I keep an eye on it from, from a patient safety perspective, as well as knowing what, uh, what technology hazards are out there. Just a reminder that these webinars are a, a team effort, and I, I'd like to thank both Justin and Annette, on, who are on the line today, for all of their hard work and input into these webinars. I do the talking, but the actual collaborative work comes from a team of us. Moving back to ECRI, I'm going to run through some of the lists or items on the list that, that resonated with me around the top 10 health technology hazards. We'll cover 2017, 18, 19 and 20. 2017, what stood out for me, of course, in that quick cleaning of complex reusable instruments can lead to infections. Yes, we do know that, and this is obviously what they've collated in their data to be the greatest risks in that particular year. Also in 2017, infection, infection risks with heat cooling devices used in cardiothoracic surgery. Quite a few published papers around that concept. Occupational radiation hazards in, in hybrid operating rooms, which is why I'm focusing a little bit on radiation safety today as well. Uh, device failures caused by cleaning products and uh, poor cleaning practices. And that is quite an issue. So if you've got an operating table that, of course, will need to be cleaned uh, and you clean it incorrectly, you use the wrong solutions or too much of a particular solution, you can uh, create incredible hazards and, and something that it's very important that you learn. And your manufacturer needs to help you understand and give you good instructions in terms of how to clean, decontaminate, disinfect uh, your operating table and equipment in your ORs. 2018, endoscope reprocessing failures. Sure, and we know that those continue to this day to expose patients to infection risks. 
Mattresses and covers becoming infected by body fluids and microbial contaminants or microbiological contaminants. That happens, of course, in the ward setting as well as in the operating room. And hopefully all of our anaesthetists have stopped that horrendous habit of, of um, uh, putting in IV needles and then sticking them into the bed or the mattress because I think it's a safe place to put it so nobody gets hurt. But of course that does put other patients at risk. Last week we focused quite a bit on fire safety and um, uh, number six on the list for 2018 was unholstered electrosurgical active electrodes leading to patient burns. Twenty nineteen, the ones that resonated with me again, the mattresses, clean mattresses can ooze body fluids onto patients. And again, not only in the operating theatre is this a problem, but it certainly can be a problem in ICUs and the ward setting as well. Retains sponges, of course the Americans refer to um, uh, swabs, abdominal swabs, they tend to refer to them as sponges. Retain sponges, persist as a surgical complication despite manual counts. Mishandling of flexible endoscopes in this regard after disinfection, not looking after them properly, contaminating them before you put them in the patient. Cleaning fluids seeping into, seeping into electrical components, leading to equipment damage and potential for fire. And moving on to 2020, uh, misuse of surgical staples I thought was quite interesting, but of course one that uh, we don't really have control over. I guess that's in the hands of the surgeon. Infection risks from sterile processing errors, in this case medical and dental offices. So looking at smaller facilities, day facilities, uh, things that are happening in the doctor's rooms, we know there is a big push from uh, medical aids for procedures to be formed in, in, in doctor's rooms, especially around flexible endoscopy. Um, there's a co-payment when the patient comes into a hospital setting that can be quite high. So there is a, a tendency to want to, to, to do the procedure in the doctor's rooms. And, and that is, is something of concern because we don't know how well that process is monitored. Um, in my own masters, when I was looking at cleaning of a, a vaginal specula in uh, the rooms of, obs of, uh, obs <laughs> of gynecologists and those guys, um, it, it was terrible what we found where the the lady who was an admin person who had no nursing experience whatsoever or any training would be washing things like vaginal specula and other instruments in the hand wash basin or of course in the basin where they do the teacups and um, leading to quite serious complications. So infection risks from sterile processing errors in medical and dental offices, in doctor's rooms, in other practice settings are something to be of, of great concern. Not audited by anybody. Um, interesting one, unproven surgical robotic procedures might put patients at risk. I don't think we are doing that in the South African setting. We have a few robots, of course, in place, and from what I understand, um, uh, all going well with the use of those. Of course, also very important how we disinfect and manage uh, the instruments that uh, come with robots, and we must follow the manufacturer's instructions. And uh, loose nuts and bolts leading to catastrophic device failures and severe injury. Again, another concept to bear in mind when it comes to servicing and maintaining all of your equipment, including your operating theatre tables. Talking about risk of contamination, this was a nice published paper from the Association of Operating Room Nurses. I think uh, quite a few of our um, papers we refer to today will be from the AO. AORN. This was quite an interesting one published this year in May. Uh, it speaks to the effect of brush, brush motion and uh, we all end up brushing stuff whether it's uh, cleaning a flexible endoscope, uh, sometimes we'll clean stuff in the operating room and other times and hopefully majority of the time it's all being done in the CSSD on the dirty side where it's meant to be done and not in the scrub basin or ante room. And as you can imagine the selection of cleaning brush type and the size done Directly will directly relates to the quality of cleaning. Using the right shape, the right diameter, and the right length is absolutely critical. In this particular study, 
They purposefully inoculated cannulated devices with the soil test and then they applied different cleaning techniques and they tested for residuals. Here with the five groups of, of different uh, cleaning methodologies, group one, they cleaned using only high pressure water and no brushing. Group two, they tried brush, brushing with a back and forth uh, motion but not rinsing the brush in between. Group three, brushing with back and forth motion but rinsing the brush in between. So uh, in and out, rinse the brush, in and out, rinse the brush. Group four, uh, brushing with a, a helical spinning motion, but not rinsing the brush. And then group five, brushing with the spinning motion and rinsing the brush. And the best technique that they um, they found was the fifth one. So brushing with a helical or a, a spinning type motion, but in between removing the tip of the brush, cleaning the brush, rinsing it off, putting it back into the device for the cleaning process. So that seems to be a very effective way of brushing. Brushing and themselves, you know, obviously need to be in good condition and um, make sure the, uh, the brush is not fallen, as in the, the bits are now um, uh, uh, fallen down and your bristles are not there or not effective. And that is important for all of us, both in the operating theatre and the CSSD environment. Interesting paper published in 2018 around, um, uh, I lie, 2015, around lead aprons. Uh, this paper looked at 64 lumbar surgeries um, using two different surgical approaches, that of robotic-assisted MIS and conventional fluoroscopy-assisted open surgeries. And two things stood out for me. I, I guess it's pretty obvious that an MIS approach would, would uh, give you less radiation exposure, but the part that made me nervous was the, um, the fact that 0.5 millimeter lead aprons only blocked one-third of, of radiation scale. I'm not that knowledgeable about lead aprons, but I do know that somebody's got to buy them for us, and I hope that, that when we're buying them, we are aware of the spec of the particular apron to make sure that it is doing what it needs to do to protect us. I think hybrid theatres are not going away. Uh, these types of MIS approaches will, will only increase. And as a result, I think it's very important that we, we make sure we're buying the right quality and the right type of lead apron. When it comes to radiation exposure, of course, the concept is that you employ the ALARA principle, the lowest radiation dose for the shortest time, the lowest reasonable achievable dose. Keeping your distance at 1.8 meters away from the, uh, from the radiation device, Keeping the x-ray tube, um, I honestly don't know which one's the x-ray tube on the C-arm. Um, I guess I could figure it out if I, if I stared at it for long enough. But on the C-arm, make sure that the x-ray tube section is underneath the operating table because that will reduce the radiation scatter. Wearing your protective clothing, lead aprons are heavy. We know that. I scrubbed for urology for a number of years and it was a bind to wear the lead apron. And sometimes I would cheat thinking I was clever, but perhaps I wasn't. Uh, thyroid shields, I don't know how often we wear them, if they are available for the staff to wear. Lead glasses, we, we know of, um, of uh, lead uh, gloves as well that one can wear pleased to make sure that we are protecting our staff and providing with them with all the adequate equipment that they need for this. Always wearing your dosimeter, which is, makes good sense. And um, a concept that I only learned when I did this research was wearing eye protection and thyroid protection, then your dosimeter goes under your apron at waist level. If you are not wearing eye protection or thyroid protection, your dosimeter should be outside your apron at collar level. I thought that was quite interesting. We referred briefly to this document in last week's webinar, and that is a, a document from ECRI that looks at strategies for surgical patient safety. And they said that there were six key risk areas that needed to be addressed and looked at in terms of operative procedures. They were complications. So, of course, complications, one that we don't have much control over personally, but, but can occur. Uh, patient and theater Readiness, definitely something we have great control over. Retain surgical items, well, that's literally in our hands. Contamination, 
also in our hands to a degree, um, equipment failures and wrong surgery. And we play a big role or potentially can play a big role in the prevention of wrong surgery. I have been involved in a, in a few instances, some as a theatre matron where we did put the wrong patient in the operating room, thankfully didn't put them to sleep yet and identified the error. One where we were taking out a K wire, um, it, uh, we made the surgeon made the incision, didn't use a, a C arm, um, tried to pull out the K wire, couldn't find it, got the C arm, rechecked his notes, and uh, then went to the, the right foot instead of the left foot and then removed the K wire had to strap up the left foot that didn't have anything wrong with it. I think he told the patient that he stubbed his toe while we were moving him. These things do happen, I guess. I was listening to a patient safety um, uh, webinar this morning and they were talking about um, uh, to err uh, is human, but um, uh, should we be covering it up? A really important, close to my heart, and I'm sure close to every one of us, is unintentionally retained foreign objects. And I've, I've had numerous an incident as a theatre sister losing a swab, not being able to find it, that horrible fear um, during your last count, getting in the sea arm, ordering the x-rays, trying to understand where it was, undoing all the rubbish, undoing all of the linen, trying to look for what you may have lost. Um, and of course, uh, the, the bigger the case, the harder it is to manage, the more blood loss, the more difficult it is, the more chaotic it is, especially with trauma, of course. And it does happen. So this is a paper published by Victoria Seelman, one of the authors. I'm referring to her because we'll be talking about another one of her papers that seems to relate to, um, to the same uh, information, but in a more in-depth manner. In this descriptive study of 308 sentinel events, um, and they were trying to to look at the contributing risk factors. So this was in uh, the period of 2012 to 2018. Um, I'm assuming these are mostly American statistics because that is uh, JACO, the, um, the authorizing uh, body that audits the operating theaters. And out of those 308 events, there were five deaths and some patients obviously underwent harm that they defined as unexpected or additional stay or extended care in the hospital. Contributing factors, important things to think about now, and we will talk about them again just now. Human factors, communication, and leadership. Most common place where objects were left, the abdomen and the vagina. Types of items, um, I was surprised that instruments was on the top of the list. I honestly would have thought swabs or packing materials would have been the top of the list, but no, not in this instance. According to this paper, 102 of the 308 were relating to instruments being left inside a patient, and, and that for me is quite scary. Catheters or drains, 52, yeah, I guess that happens. Needles or blades, Blades? Wow, that's sad. I would have hoped one doesn't lose a blade. Uh, needles? Sure. Um, I don't know. I was always taught to count them, but, uh, but I guess that can go wrong. Packing? I can understand a vaginal pack being left behind. That's happened a few times to patients of ours. Um, implants? I wasn't, didn't quite understand that. Specimens and other. Not too sure what other meant. They didn't specify that in the document. Right, the, uh, a, a gentleman by the name of Reasons apparently has identified this concept called the Swiss cheese model. It's not something I'm very familiar with, but I'm now learning about it. And uh, I also was exposed to that uh, this morning in the Patient Safety Congress that I was attending. Um, and as I understand, it's trying to understand um, hazards. And, and if, all the, if the, all the holes line up, that's when a hazard or an incident or an event does tend to occur. The negative patient outcomes from uh, retained surgical items, of course, can include needing uh, another surgical procedure, which can relate in prolonged hospital stay, uh, readmission to hospital, infection or sepsis, visceral perforation, and sadly, death. So what is an active failure? They define an active failure as something that happens when the staff ignore specific policies that are there for a reason, policies and procedures, or make a mistake that directly affects a patient. 
latent conditions are, are factors in the settings or the environment that can contribute to the likelihood of an error of an error like not orientating your staff properly in the beginning um, being short of staff uh, failure to dis disruptive behavior we did speak about uh, doctor bullying and staff bullying one onto the other also important concepts that um, that do seem to affect patient safety. So that behavior is important for a multitude of reasons, not just for, um, for good communication, but for patient safety. So again, this is also Victoria Steelman from the um, Association of Operating Room Nurses drilling down deeper into, into the previous um, uh, article as well. They identified, Jack of the Joint Commission, identified between one to 12 contributing factors for each of those 308 events that they refer to. And the most frequently identified, as you can see, are human factors, leadership, and communication. The subcategories for human factors include distraction, and we spoke about distraction quite a lot before, about noise in the operating room and how that can distract us. We've spoken about mobile phones. We've spoken about doctors and anaesthetists using their devices and the distraction that that can cause. We've spoken about social visits that can create distraction, terrible noises, fatigue. As we know, and fatigue is something we can we can surely expect amongst our staff at the moment, and drift. I um, guess drift means not focusing, not being in the moment, not being mindful, drifting off, thinking about something else while you were doing what it is you are meant to be doing, and as a result, there is an error, an adverse event, something that is terrible for our patients. So what are the, the recommendations? So the researchers made these recommendations to, to prevent uh, the uh, retaining um, foreign objects in the patient. For addressing human factors, they refer to um, team training, an obvious and important concept. Managing disruptive behavior, that seems to come up quite a bit in amongst these studies. Verifying the integrity of the objects removed, I guess making sure that you have the whole catheter and you haven't left the tip behind, or you have the entire specimen and you haven't left a section of it behind. Addressing leadership issues, they refer to conducting uh, proactive risk assessments and then basing all your policies on those risk assessments and auditing compliance. And, and for me, I, I think a quality management system, having that in place would also be important. And I guess it's about being aware of where your risks lie. And you're not going to know that unless you've done some form of audit, some form of assessment. And, and I think um, the private healthcare groups are quite good at, at putting those uh, assessments in place, but important concept to continue with. Other recommendations, of course, is communication, and uh, I think communication, communication, and communication. One of them, using the whiteboard, which I hope we all do still use. Um, I don't know if, if you're doing um, surgical safety checklists as well, if you're doing that uh, timeout process, and maybe having a visual display of the timeout process, that can also help. Um, writing things that you've inserted onto the board remain an important concept. I don't care if you've been a scrub sister for 30 years, and please, um, in fact, if you've been a scrub sister for 30 years, your memory is probably going a bit, so it's quite critical that we do record things on the board. Write on the board, item left in the vagina, swabs packed somewhere that we remember to take them out at the end of the case. Verbally acknowledging the removal of particular objects, and, and that's part of surgical safety checklists, and um, discussing packing during handover, of course. This is Mrs. Jones. She's got a vaginal plug in situ. And finding some form of best practice alert to remind the surgeon to actually order the removal of, of the packaging as and when required. Important concepts. Thank you, Nanette, for this uh, lesson on this very difficult word I now have to pronounce. I'm going to guess it is pronounced gossiparboma. And gossiparboma is the term that, that denotes a mass of cotton material, gauze, or of course sponges or swabs or towels, inadvertently left in the body cavity at the end of a surgical operation. Lovely picture, I must say, it really does... Um, 
show how, uh, how we encapsulate foreign bodies. The word is derived from a combination of the Latin term meaning a textile, gossi paim, and the Swahili word called boma. Of course, in bomas we normally have bras, but uh, I'll change my mindset now about a bra and a boma every time I'll remember gossi pa boma. Other terms include hmm, interesting textiloma, I think, and uh, gauzomas, I guess I'll be pronouncing. And this was first described by Wilson in 1881. Gossipiboma has been reported after orthopedic spinal surgery, orthopedic surgery, spinal surgery, breast surgery, and most common in intra-abdominal or pelvic surgery. I guess because of the size of the cavity and the and the ability for us to lose things in there is, is pretty good. As you would and we would all imagine is that there is a high degree of underreporting. We know the fear of litigation, and um, as a result, it, it, we tend to try and not report these things. This accounts for 50% of all malpractice claims for retained foreign bodies. It's quite high, according to this particular published paper. Risk factors include emergency operations, definitely, trauma, team fatigue, unplanned change in the, oper in the operation, and patients with high body mass index. And those are risks that we should be taking into account, and we should have them in our top of our minds as we start the procedure, because uh, we, we should remember that this could potentially happen. It was quite nice to be able to find some South African statistics. Um, as you can see, analysis of surgical adverse events at a major university hospital in South Africa. This was published in 2019 in the World uh, Journal of Surgery. In the background, it talks about the fact that surgical never events have serious adverse outcomes for patients and that a never event can be described as a serious, avoidable patient safety incident that would not have occurred if the preventative measures had been implemented. The uh, published paper does say that literature from, the, from South Africa on the topic is limited, so it was, it was good to see this publication. This was a retrospective review uh, taken over a five-year period, also 2012 to 2017, in the Peter Maritzburg Metropolitan Surgical Services. It would be so interesting if anybody repeated this uh, in amongst um, the rest of the country, both private and provincial. It would be really interesting. So all morbidities and surgical NEVI events uh, recorded were recorded and analysed. There was a particular system that they used for that that they describe in the paper. In that period, there were a total of 20,432 patient admissions and a total of 7,187 morbidities were recorded. Hmm. Of them, uh, 79 of the 7,187 constituted a never event. So a never event, something that was, could have been avoided if we had applied the correct processes of principles. Of the 79 never events, um, they related to general surgery, uh, which was the highest, trauma surgery, and pediatric surgery. Wow, that surprised me a little bit. Um, in addition to those 79 never events, a total of 126 near misses were identified. I guess we are we really want a, a repeatable, reliable service in our operating theatres, and we want the, the, the least, least amount of risk. And, and these um, statistics, I think, are a little bit scary. Another grave concern is specimen errors, and how do we reduce specimen errors? And of course, quite obviously, that when accurate results of specimen examinations are not available because of specimen errors, and those errors include loss, incorrect labeling, and mishandling, um, physicians may diagnose patients or, impl or implement incorrect treatment plans, and that's going to lead or potentially leads to patients requiring additional surgery. In this particular paper, they state that researchers estimate that approximately 17% of surgical misidentification errors result in patients undergoing incorrect therapies, and about 6% of the errors result in adverse events. I 
think a, a really common um, uh, issue in, in our settings is communication and language barriers and language difficulties. Uh, a surgeon mumbling under his mask, or the, or the scrub nurse or the scrub person mumbling over the mask, that that's the left fallopian tube, as we know, can go wrong. And then it's about knowing how to spell that particular thing. And I think something that we need to focus on in terms of our, our, um, our teaching and training I recently underwent some surgery and, and during the surgery the, the nurse doing the, the checklist and the admission um, spelled the oddest of things and quite sadly badly and, and also um, didn't interpret what she was reading. So one of the questions she's, uh, she's also asked my husband once before is, are you pregnant? So we really need to make sure that we're teaching our student nurses to think, to listen, to write and to spell correctly because it is quite important when it the more detailed um, study, they looked at 648 specimen area events. Um, this is in uh, 2016, and they realized that 51% uh, of them there was a contributing specific factors that they could identify. And the two most common contributing factors were failures in communication and failures in patient care handovers. Patient care handovers surprised me a little bit, but failures in communication are, are not a big surprise at all. So the ARN guideline for specimen management clearly says that the surgeon and the, the circulator should use the, the write-down read-back technique. And that uh, quite obviously is that you record uh, verbally, uh, the doctor says what it is, uh, you write it down accurately, legibly, and, and read back. So, Dr. I've written here, this is the left fallopian tube, is that correct? And, of course, spelling will matter. Uh, if we want to avoid errors, we need good light so that we can find the specimens and see the specimens and record what it is we are doing. So, let's chat a little bit about surgical lighting. Before electricity, we perform surgery using candlelight, oil and gas lamps, uh, surgery during daylight hours and using natural light and illumination. Electricity discovered in 1879 and artificial surgical lighting in 1913, starting with uh, clusters of incandescent lamps, halogen type lamps and LEDs. So in order to summarize all of this, my husband's electrical engineer, so I had to go through about an hour lecture to be able to create the next slide so that he made 100 percent sure that I understood this concept correctly. What is the difference between an incandescent light and an LED, a light emitting diode? So an incandescent light, as you can see, has a filament and the electrical current uh, goes through the filament and that's how uh, we create light. An LED, a light emitting diode, emits light by passing a current through a solid um, semiconductor material. Because the mechanism is quite different, um, the light and LED light stays much cooler versus that of an incandescent type light. So LED lights are cool lights. They have got long life to them. It's a, it's, a, it's a white light referred to as a white light. And the color of the light does matter because it uh, plays a role in what it is we see uh, during the surgical procedure. Uh, a concept I also learned just a few, few years ago, I didn't know this is a theater matron, that in some uh, countries it is critical that uh, the manufacturer of a surgical light performs the following test around ventilation and air conditioning um, around a light. And the idea is to test the effect of light, um, uh, the airflow turbulence, and whether or not the light gets in the way in the airflow turbulence. So they do this in 25 different positions. Uh, they then me measure the mean intensity for the 25 positions, and then they define the, um, the ratio, and that the, it must be equal to or less than 37.5%. So if you're buying a light, it's a concept you must take into consideration, and you can ask the manufacturer whether or not they have done that testing and what the result is for that particular light. When we're buying lights, what do we need to consider and what do we need to think about? If you're creating yourself a checklist, uh, these are important factors. The illumination, 
the color temperature, the color rendering, the radiant heat, the heat dissipation, shadow reduction, and depth of field. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail in a couple of these things. So illumination, how bright you want the light to be, and um, some lights may be modular, and therefore you can have a, a light that is then brighter by adding uh, additional arms or uh, parts to it. Uh, whether or not the light intensity can be adjusted, because that matters, and what the peak luminance is, and it's measured in lux of that particular light. And of course, where you use the light will influence what type of lux you'll need. If you're going in the abdomen, you need a lot of light. If it's superficial surgery, there's light. Of course, the tissues will absorb light as well, so that does matter. Shadow reduction, the surgeon puts his head in the way of the light, how noticeable are the shadows? Can you see them? Does it create an obstacle? Or can you still see your surgical site when the head is in the way? Depth of field. How far away from the surgical of the site should the light be for optimal performance? How sensitive is the light to the pattern size? Can you adjust it? Um, and what is the focal length? So can you turn the knob and make the sweet spot a bit smaller? Can you turn the knob and make the sweet spot a bit bigger? However you make those adjustments. Important concepts and things to think about depending on the type of surgery. In some theatres, of course, we will uh, stick to certain types or disciplines of surgery. In others, we need the, the operating theatre to, to do anything from orthopaedics through to ENT, and uh, therefore we need to take that into consideration when we're designing and building our theatres. And of course, we need to take into consideration how they all hang and fit and that they don't bump into each other. We spoke about that the other day. If the lights are bumping into each other, greater risk of, of um, stuff falling from the lights into the surgical field. An important thing we need to miss, and there's, um, as you know, published papers around that, that um, the surgical uh, light guide from Steris, um, yes, it is written by a manufacturer, but it is really quite nice. If you would like it, with pleasure, I can um, send you the PDF version. It does teach you quite a lot about lights. Do drop us an email and we can send it through to you with pleasure. Moving on to lights and ventilation. So we, we know that now we don't want our light to impede the airflow or the HVAC or the ventilation in the operating room. Briette spoke to us a lot about uh, about airflow, air exchanges earlier on in her in her webinar too, um, around also humidity in the operating room, which, which all forms part of the ventilation. And that ventilation, of course, is very important. The, um, whether or not uh, you have laminar flow or you don't have laminar flow in your operating room, you certainly still want to, to be able to, to let the ventilation work as effectively as possible and have the correct HEPA filters. We know um, from some of the papers that we've seen in the US, they seem to be allowing a 30-minute uh, stand time between procedures with the doors closed to allow for ventilation, to circulate out the COVID-19, to let it go through the HEPA filters, um, and obviously make making sure that the, the airflow is good. A um, interesting paper published now um, recently in the American Journal of Infection Control um, in, in the journal preproof version, not the finalized version yet, about um, how operating air delivery is designed to protect the patient in the surgical site and the particles released um, tend to have a greater concentration on the walls of the rooms. And I think they did this with COVID in mind. You know, where's the safest place to be in the operating room if you don't want to get COVID from the patient? Well, it's a little bit closer to the operating field, but of course not in the way. Or please don't contaminate anything. So um, perhaps the floor nurses shouldn't hang around the corners too much. Moving on to the topic of, of lab of flow, I have not uh, gone into great depth on that, but probably in the last five years I've come across numerous uh, published papers around laminar flow and looking at whether or not we do need laminar flow doesn't make a difference for total joint arthroplasties and uh, post-operative um, joint infections. And it remains a debate. Um, there's those that say it's important. Others that believe it's something that, that is not 
necessarily. Um, you can look at the paper over there on the cost-benefit analysis of different exchange rates in the operating rooms. Um, I've also heard of people looking at the concept of turning off the aircon at night uh, from a cost-saving perspective um, and then you know, running it again in the morning for a period of time. That also remains a debate uh, with everything. Of course, there is a pro and a con. And in the current environment of COVID, uh, I'm not so sure I'd be comfortable to do that anymore. Finishing up with uh, with risk, of course, one of the greatest risks we've referred to before and a good cause of, of never events or near events or adverse events is that of staff shortages and staff shortages, nurse burnout, all become high risk things. That's a patient safety issue. So taking care of our staff, uh, us taking care of ourselves is a patient safety issue, something that is really, really important. What are the barriers to to taking care of ourselves amongst nurses. Um, interesting paper in, um, in the ARN, of course, nurses, uh, health promoting behaviours, knowledge, and we have the knowledge, but does that knowledge translate into self-care? Apparently not. Even though we have all of the knowledge, for whatever reason, we somehow or another don't look after ourselves. They highlighted intrinsic factors and extrinsic factors. So e extrinsic factors being um, interpersonal influences, influences of other people, of family and friends, situational influences like I have to go to work, uh, work schedules, um, uh, we need money, all of those things of course uh, play a role. And intrinsic uh, factors of course will be whether or not you believe it to be something that's good or not good. It depends, I often think um, your generation may play a role. Um, older, older nurses, of course, we go with the suck it up theory, uh, survive, live with it, move on, you can do it. Um, and, and younger nurses tend to be more self-aware, I think, and um, things we need to bear in mind and are a bit more aware of their own self-care needs. Uh, personal factors, age, sex, uh, past experiences, whether you're already in a fatigue state or in an, uh, in an is issue with anxiety or depression, will affect your ability to make clear decisions about your own self-care. So self-care promotes safer patient care. That's the paper that was published in the ARN, um, this one from a little while ago. In there they listed five, I thought, important concepts that we can all talk about. Physical care, physical self-care, looking after yourself physically, as we know. Work-life balance. I do wonder if coming home and having a glass of wine with your dinner, um, uh, will that be enough work-life balance? Uh, maybe not. Uh, making sure that we do do our own healthcare checkups, as we know we should be doing. Team building and fun at work, um, something I, I did try and employ as a theatre matron, something I quite enjoyed doing, um, and hopefully there's uh, stuff we can do around that occasionally. And of course there's that concept of mindfulness, um, uh, one that you can go read up on the topic and something that hopefully will help us promote our own self-care amongst nurses.